Hello, AP Stat students. Mr. Hazelhorst coming to you live from room A08 this morning. Um, today we're going to continue on in Chapter 5, Section 2. So this will be Chapter 5, Section 2B. And we're going to continue our discussion of probability models. So again, we want to think about sample spaces and events um, and all those terms that we covered in the first video. Uh, but today we're going to look at those concepts uh, under uh, the guise of two-way tables and Venn diagrams and utilizing uh, these two types of organization techniques uh, to create the sample space of a setting. Um, and again, this will be a very helpful tool as we work through different probability settings over the course of chapters five, six, and seven. All right, so let's just jump right into it. The first thing that we need to do is we kind of need to flash back to chapter one and we need to remind you of what a two-way table is. All right, so a two-way table just simply shows the distribution of two categorical variables. All right, so the data below uh, represents, uh, or the table below represents data for a college statistics class. So you can see we have the, um, the table or the, the data divided into two different categorical variables. Uh, we have their gender and then whether or not they have their, their ears pierced. All right, so we can gather all kinds of information um, off of this table, and we could use this to answer lots of probability questions, okay? And that's exactly what we're going to do, all right? So uh, if we jump ahead here, all right, again, we've got this table representing the data for college stats class. So we want to use this two-way table um, to answer some probability questions, and, and this is representing a probability model. Now, we don't have probabilities listed out there, uh, but we do have every possible outcome of this setting. Right. If we think about all the possible outcomes here um, that are a result of these two categorical variables, it would be possible for our students to be a male with their ears pierced, male without their ears pierced, female with ears pierced, and female without ears pierced. Okay. And again, we can use this information to answer just basic probability questions. So uh, if I were to take this information from the table to answer the following three questions, the first one is, uh, let's find the probability that a student has pierced ears, okay? So if I take a look at the table as it's presented here, right, the number of students who have their ears pierced is 103, and the total number of students is 178. All right, so my probability here would be 103 out of 178. Very easy, again, to use a two-way table to answer questions of probability, okay? So let's go to part B. Uh, let's say we want to find the probability that uh, the student is a male and has pierced ears, okay? Well, now instead of working out in the totals, right, pierced ears was one of our categorical variables, so we worked in the totals. Now we're getting to some more specific breakdown um, of those categorical variables. So we want the student to be male and have their ears pierced, right? So the probability the student is male and ears pierced, well, that's these 19 people located in our table here. Again, we're going to put that out of the total of 178. So our probability would be 19 over 178. All right. Now, when we get to part C, it gets a little bit more interesting, okay? So we want to find the probability that the student is a male. And now notice we changed our word. In B, we said male and. In C, we're saying male or has pierced ears. All right now, you might remember there were a couple of uh, commercials going on uh, about a year ago about they would say the difference between and and or, uh, right? Then like sweet and sour chicken and sweet or sour chicken, uh, you know, two different things. And, uh, anyway, all right, so we need to understand again the difference between or. And means that both of those characteristics have to be in place. Or means that only one of them has to be in place. All right, so we could be male, right? Or we could have our ears pierced, okay? So if we add those numbers together, all right, we've got 90 over 178 plus 103 over 178. Now, we run into a bit of a dilemma here because if we add these probabilities together, we end up with 193 out of 178. Well, hopefully you picked up on something as I was working through this problem. And that's the fact that these events are not mutually exclusive. If we go back to that term that we talked yesterday, right? These events have something in common. It is possible for me to be male and have my ears pierced, right? This group right here, 
if I just work with the totals, has been counted twice. Once in the male total and once in the Pierce Beers total. So that means in order for us to represent this probability accurately, uh, we need to remove that repeat. So we need to subtract 19 out of 178, all right, which would give us 174 out of 178. And this answer makes a lot more sense, all right, especially when you consider it's all three of these numbers that are being added together to create our probability. Well, the only thing we've eliminated then is the four, okay? And so this illustrates a very important rule in mathematics that we refer to as the general addition rule for two events. So yesterday we talked about the addition rule that and how it applied to uh, mutually exclusive events. And we said if events are mutually exclusive, we can just add their probabilities together. All right. Well, the addition, the general addition rule takes into consideration those times where our events are not mutually exclusive. So we're going to add their probabilities, but then we're going to subtract what they have in common, right? That probability of A and B. Um, now, you could use this rule in mutually exclusive events as well, but if they're mutually exclusive, the probability of being A and B would be zero, right? So this is a rule that we want to be able to utilize. Uh, we could see that on the previous example problem, okay? All right, well, now let's get into some Venn diagrams here, all right? So you've probably seen Venn diagrams before. So I'm just going to give you a couple images of some different Venn diagrams and what they can represent in probability settings. And we'll kind of make note of some notation here. Um, and then we're going to actually create a Venn diagram for a probability setting. So the first diagram I have representing here is if we wanted to represent the complement, right? So the square shape that we see it here is representing the entire sample space. We could label that S, right? So if I'm talking about a complement, you either are or you aren't in, right? Um, <clears throat> so you can see that these two areas are labeled. So we have this circle, which is representing event A, and then everything outside of the circle is representing the complement of A. So notice the notation that's being used within the, the Venn diagram, right? Event A and the complement of A, all right? So that's how we would represent a complement. If we are talking about uh, disjoint or mutually exclusive events, right? We have event A, we have event B. Notice that they are completely separate, all right? So you can see in this Venn diagram, we've got the capital letter S representing here. So this rectangle as a whole is representing the entire sample space. So in this Venn diagram, we could say you're either A or you're B, and then we could add another label to this Venn diagram to represent this kind of beige colored area, or this yellow colored area, all right? And if I were to label this, uh, if my yellow circle is A and my blue circle is B, that means being outside here would be the complement of A and the complement of B, all right? What that's saying is I'm A, I'm B, or I'm neither of them, okay? So this is saying not A and not B, all right? So that's how we represent disjoint or mutually exclusive um, events within a Venn diagram, all right? Now, two more uh, kind of new terms that we want to introduce through the use of a Venn diagram. And the first term is the idea of the intersection. So if A and B are not disjoint, um, we have circle A, we have circle B, and then notice that these overlap, all right? And the area that overlaps in green, this is what's known as the intersection area, all right? We say it is A and B. Now, some symbolism to be aware of, all right, is what we see up above here, all right? This is a way that we can, in shorthand notation, write A and B, because I know it takes a lot of work to write out the word and. Um, but we use this upside down U area. That represents the area where these two events overlap or intersect each other, okay? The opposite of and then would be the word or, all right? We can represent that in a Venn diagram as well. So if we were talking about A or B, well, notice now that A and B circles are both entirely filled in, right? Because to be A or B, I could be just A, I could be just B, or I could be A and B. And this is what we refer to as the union of two events. And the symbolism that we use here is a U. 
Okay. And so these are just all different types of probability notation that you're going to see pop up over the course of chapters five, six, and seven. All right, so what we want to do next now, uh, well, let's compare first off two-way tables and Venn diagrams. So if we go back to our two-way table uh, that we had to begin class, all right? So beginning class, uh, we had this two-way table. And what I have here is a Venn diagram that is representing this information from a two-way table, right? So kind of the moon shape of B, all right? Well, this circle is representing event B, and we can see that that probability is 103 out of 178. We have the circle representing yellow, right? And the probability being there is 90 over 178. We have the, the uh, intersection area, right, that's represented in green, 19 out of 178. And then our other four students, um, you know, they would fall, you know, somewhere outside of this category, okay? All right, so that is our sample space of that two-way table. Now, let's talk about how to create one of these of our own. All right, so here we've got some information. It says in an apartment complex, 40% of residents read the USA Today. Only 25% read the New York Times. 5% of residents read both papers. And suppose we select a resident of the apartment complex at random and record which of the two papers the person reads. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to construct a two-way table that represents this information. Okay. So we are representing the two categorical variables. Uh, they read the USA Today or they read the New York Times. Right, we're comparing those two variables. Okay, so we're going to create a two-way table here. So they either read the USA Today, so we're going to say yes, or they don't. And same thing with the New York Times. They either read it or they don't. So Y is representing yes, N is representing no. So if we create a little table here, all right, we know there are four different possible outcomes uh, that could occur here. They could read both papers, right? That would be this box. They could read the New York Times, but not the USA Today. They could read the USA Today, but not the New York Times, or they could read neither of the papers, okay? Now, we're also going to extend this table to include totals, all right? And you'll see why that is as we go through this problem, okay? So now we want to read back through our problem. We want to pull out the numbers, and we want to put them in the appropriate places within this, within this table, okay? So the first number we come across is that number 40%. So we say that 40% of residents read the USA Today. Now, that number is not going to exist inside the table, but that 40% is representing the total of people who would say yes to New York Times. Now, I know a little bit about logic and probability, and that means if 40% would say yes to New York Times, what percent would say no, or excuse me, not New York Times, uh, USA Today? If 40% would say yes to USA Today, what percent would say no? Well, that probability would be 60%, right? Because in total, this all has to equal 100%. All right? Now, let's go the same way uh, with our next number. So the next number we come across is that they read, 25% read the New York Times. So that means, again, that's a total number. Uh, that's our row total for New York Times being yes. So if 25% say yes to New York Times, we know then that 75% would say no. So again, if we add up our column totals and our row totals, all in all, it should equal 100%. Right? Now, none of those numbers have helped us fill in the sample space, so we need to keep reading. Okay? Well, we have one more number that's in there. All right? And it says 5% uh, of residents read both papers. Well, now I can go back and I can fill in that yes and yes position, right? That's 5%. And because I know the, the row and column totals, this 5% is all I need to go back and fill in the rest of this information. So if 5% would say yes to both, all right, if I'm working within my USA Today yes column, well, I know that has to total together to be 40%. So that means the only value that could go here is 35%. Meaning 35% of the people in this apartment complex read the USA Today, but do not read the New York Times. All right? And again, we can go back and fill in the, the rows as well. So if 5% said yes to both, 
if I'm in this New York Times yes row, well, in order for that row to equal 25%, this value has to be 20%. And then the last position that I have left over, well, in order for that to be true, right, that's going to equal 40%. Now, notice, if I just take up the events that make up my sample space, all right, so this area outlined in red is the actual sample space of this problem. All right, in order for this to be a legitimate sample space and a legitimate probability distribution, all of those probabilities had better add up to 1 or 100%. And if we add them together, they do, right? 5% plus 35% is 40%, plus 20% is 60%, plus the 40% is 100%, right? So we have just taken the information that we were provided and we've made a two-way table, okay? Now, let's talk about what if we would have created a Venn diagram to start, all right? Our Venn diagram is a little bit different, okay? So if I read through this problem the first time, the first thing I need to look for is, are these events mutually exclusive or is it possible to be both? Right? Well, as we read through this problem, we are told there is a group of, of, of apartment residents that read both papers. So when I go to draw this Venn diagram then, all right, if this is representing my sample space, all right, so I'm going to label it with an S, okay? Um, and I'm going to define some events just to save me some writing. So let's say event A is representing USA Today, and event B is representing the New York Times. Okay. So we'd have these two events. So let's say here's USA Today, we'll call that A. Here's B, representing New York Times. And we do have them overlapping, all right? Now, when we are to complete a Venn diagram, again, remember this entire table needs to add up to 100%. Okay, so we go back and we start filling in numbers. Now, where we always want to begin is we always want to begin in the overlap, the intersection region, if at all possible. Right, and we are given that number, right? So we're told that 5% read both USA Today and the New York Times. And now from here, we're able to take our other numbers and start to break down those other areas. All right, so this moon shape for A, what this would technically be representing is they read the USA Today, but not the New York Times. Okay. So if I know that 40% of my residents read USA Today, this A circle in total has to add up to 40%. Now again, we've already got 5% of it on the diagram. So that's where this 35% is going to come from. Okay? And again, this area would be corresponding to this position in the two-way table. Yes to USA Today, but no to New York Times. Okay? And we do the same thing with the B circle. We know in total the B circle has to equal 25%. Well, again, we've already got 5% accounted for here. So that means we've got a 20% here. And then everything outside of these two circles will be whatever's left over. All right, that's where the 40% comes from. All right, and we could use either of these uh, to answer just simple probability questions. So probability that a person reads at least one of the two newspapers Right? Well, that means it's going to be the probability that they exist within right, one of these three regions here. It's either just A, just B, or both. So if we add up all those probabilities, we come up with 60%. Right? The probability that the person doesn't read either, well, that means they exist outside of our circles, that'd be 40%. So hopefully you see that two-way tables and Venn diagrams are, are useful tools for us to create a probability model to represent a, a given chance process. And, and that's what we've done here. And this will be something that you'll be expected to be able to do uh, on both the quiz and the test later on this chapter. All right. Well, again, I want to thank you for giving me your time today. I hope you took some good notes so that you can use those on the Chapter 5 quiz. Um, as always, please take the time to complete the form below, again, ranking your level of understanding and leaving any questions, concerns, or topics you'd like addressed further uh, listed out down below. All right, make it a great day. We'll see you soon.